the ubiquitous Yanomi. This is the, the daily teacup that uh, most uh, potteries in Japan uh, will make. Uh, each pottery has its individual style and efforts involved in making this kind of humble cup. Um, it's great for tea, it's good for bourbon, whiskey, it's good for lots of things. But um, it's, uh, I really enjoy still uh, making Yanomis. It's a, it's a way of, of kind of um, you know, warming up in the pottery. I attach as much importance, I think, to making this very simple cup as I would making or hand building a stacking box or a, uh, hand building a large vase or something. It's a very, I think, important cup. Teaches me a lot about line and gesture and movement. Um, I make them maybe a little bit bigger than they were traditionally made, but I like to put a, a little bit of a dent or a thumbprint in there to make it more comfortable in my hand. And I think it also serves as a way of, of locating the, the cup in somebody else's hand so that there may be some visual element that happens during the process of the wood firing. There's another one with some inlaid rope pattern and some iron decoration on it, a foot. So I'm gonna throw a few of these. And this is a leech style kick wheel. Um, this is a type of wheel that I learned on. I, uh, for the most part, work on a Japanese style kick wheel, which is uh, just, uh, it doesn't get powder with a treadle. And Warren brought this type of wheel back from the leech pottery in England and introduced it into this area. Usually, um, in, at least at the pottery I worked at in Japan, we would finish the inside of the cup with a, a tool called an egote, and it's a, it's a rib on a stick, and it has kind of a flat bottom area here. They like their teacups, tea bowls, and in teapots, did I say teapots? Um, they use a tool like this to, to shape the bottom. They kind of want a flat bottom. So when I'm throwing this cup, typically I try to just do them as sketches. I don't have any uh, set measurement or anything else. And one of the things I'm thinking about is the, the flow of the line, kind of the movement. I also think a lot about the, the lip shape. So I want the lip to be comfortable on somebody else's mouth. The lip also functions, I think, for a, as an entry point into the interior space of the piece, so it becomes uh, somewhat important. The um, han handles in Japan, I don't know at what point they begin to introduce, but typically in traditional older Japanese pots, you don't see handles on the pieces. And uh, in probably the 19... 30s and 40s when Bernard Leach came to town, so to speak, that there were some potteries that began to introduce the idea of a, a handled cup into the Japanese milu. And, uh, but when tea is served in a yunomi, they never fill the, the tea to the top. In America, you think you're getting shortchanged if you don't get your coffee right up to the upper lip. But in Japan, they traditionally would never fill this more than here. And uh, very often, if, if you fill it all the way up, you can't hold it because it's too hot. So very often they'll hold the, the cup like this. And this is the handle they talk about in Japan. The clay that Jan and I use here at the pottery is a, a mixture of clay from, the fire clay comes mainly from Missouri. Uh, it's a Hawthorne Bond fire clay. And we add, to that we add ball clay and we add uh, kyanite. Kyanite's a mineral that's ground and mined in uh, Virginia area. It's a very high aluminum material. And 
we also add uh, some Helmar kaolin, but I uh, calcine the kaolin, which means that I heat it up in a bisque kiln to cone one. And the reason for that is I want to take the shrinkage out of it, but retain the color you know, of the, the clay itself. Uh, as I mentioned um, earlier, that we fire in one of two wood kilns, and those wood kilns fire, fire for either three and a half or five, five and a half days. So we need a, a clay body that's quite durable in terms of standing up to the, to the heat. We don't fire super hot in the, the wood kiln. We fire to about cone 10 down. And the reason I don't fire hotter is that I find I'm, I'm after uh, red colors and kind of saturated yellows and browns and with kind of a celadon type ash surface if, if the ash start, starts to, to melt on the pot. And I, I find that when you get into the hotter temperatures, if you get up into cone 11, 12, um, and never fired a 13, but the colors tend to start to disappear. They brown out, and the pots start to get really glassy in their nature. And Jan and I have always looked for a more matte um, surface and uh, predominantly kind of cultivating the reds. I, it was real in Japan. I, fell in love with um, some pots from the Tokonami region of Japan. And these were big jars that were actually not used for food. They were used for storing uh, religious document scrolls. And I remember when I first saw those pieces in Japan and saw the colors, I, I just fell in love with them and decided that I wanted to try to achieve that kind of uh, depth and color on my, on my pieces. So I've sought out using clays that I think reinforce those colors and in my own thinking that it's, it's clay that has a trace of iron, some titanium, a fair amount of alumina in it. And then the other trick is to figure out in the firing process when to do the reduction and oxidation in the kiln.